How stressed are you? How stressed am I? This morning, you can find out, or at least find out how you can find out. Let me introduce you to something called the Holmes and Ray Stress Scale. I realise not everyone will be able to see this clearly. Those in the front probably can see it, those in the back less so. But what I can do is I can talk us through it a little bit. And basically, um, I found out about this at Theological College so that we could notice if stress was building in our lives as ministers, but also so that we could be aware that stress might be building in the lives of our people in our congregation. And basically this stress scale, it allows you to tally up the range of stress-inducing events that might happen in a person's life over 12 months, over a year, uh, to see how your how high your combined stress level might be. And, and obviously this scale, um, like anything put together by psychiatrists and psychologists, it's not without its critics, it has critics. But the idea is that the amount of points a person racks up in a given year can predict with some decent accuracy whether that person might have a low or moderate or high chance of getting ill triggered by stress. So you add them together to find out your score. Uh, sometimes these things are better understood by actually trying them out. So I'll be your guinea pig. <laughs> you can find out how I've been doing the last 12 months. So this is my last year. Total score of 143. So I put a star by personal illness. As you know, uh, I had COVID last year and then later in the year, a string of nasty coughs, colds, and a chest infection, and a stomach bug at the end of the year. So I was ill more in that year than I think I've ever been in my whole life. Um, so that was, that was last year. I also put a star by change in church activities. Again, uh, well, of course, Mike being on sabbatical. Uh, change in responsibilities at work, because church is part of my work. So obviously that's a change of Mike being on sabbatical again. Um, vacation, it's interesting. Not just negative things can add stress. Fun things, good things can as well. Vacation, we went to South Africa. Um, and also major holiday. By that, I'm thinking of Christmas. So that's 13 and 12, respectively. Oh, and minor mortgage or loan, 17. So all sorts of things can add to that. And that gives me a grand total of 143, meaning I have a low risk of illness triggered by stress. That's why I put it in green. Of course, yours might be higher, especially, for example, if you've um, lost a relative this year, for example, or had relationship difficulties, or um, maybe you've had to move for some reason, that, that adds to it. Or your score might be lower than mine, maybe. Um, that's great. I hope it is. But just noticing this can actually be helpful because... Um, it can inform our decision making. So, for example, if you've got a very high, if I had a very high score, that year might not be the best time to move house, for example, and take on a big mortgage and pack loads of boxes up because that would just be um, not a good idea. You're going to think I'm crazy here, um, but let's try this stress scale on some people from the Bible. And I'm thinking of two particular people. Naomi and Ruth from the book of Ruth. Let's have a look at Naomi first. Oh, wow. 276. I'll give you a bit of backstory. We're going to have a reading, but it's going to be more like in the middle of the sermon. Um, but I need to give some backstory so that you understand the reading. So Naomi was from Bethlehem, or at least her husband was. Her husband was called Elimelech. And Naomi and Elimelech and their sons, Marlon and Kilion, they had to leave Bethlehem because there was a famine there, and they went to the land of Moab. And it's quite interesting that they went to Moab because Israelites and Moabites, they didn't get on. They did not get on at all. Uh, but Moab was where there was food. So they went there, they followed the food. Then something terrible happened. Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died. You might be wondering why I didn't put a star next to death of spouse on the scale. Well, that's because when we meet Naomi at the beginning of Ruth, uh, the book of Ruth, 
It had happened 10 years ago. She'd lost her husband 10 years ago. Um, so then it's Naomi, Marlon, and Kilion. And Marlon and Kilion, her sons, they marry Moabite women. One named Orpah and one named Ruth. And Naomi is provided for by her sons and their wives. She lives in Moab for a total of 10 years before more terrible things happen. Naomi's sons, Marlon and Kilion, both die, leaving her and their widows in a patriarchal society, very patriarchal society, without any males to protect them, defend them, give them offspring, provide for them. And so I've marked Naomi's stress scale chart with two stars for death of family member because she lost both her sons. I've also marked change in financial state and changing in, change in living conditions because Naomi is now destitute. Change in residence because it's going to be very likely that she'll have to move um, back to where her relatives are from. Change in recreation because she probably has to spend her time differently now. She might have to beg, for example, or spend time begging. Um, what else? Change in social activities for the same reason. Change in number of family reunions because she will have to go and reunite with some of her family in order to survive. They might not be pleased to see her after she swanned off to Moab and now wants to come back again. And of course, change in eating habits. Without her husband or sons, it's likely that she doesn't have much to eat. So that gives Naomi a total score of 276 on the stress scale, which means her risk of stress-triggered illness is moderate. How would you feel in Naomi's situation? How would you feel? Perhaps you've had a year in your life where you reckon probably, yeah, your score was in the 200s. You might have an insight about how she felt because of that. Now, if you think Naomi's stress scale is high, have a look at Ruth. Three hundred and forty nine, which means she's in the high risk zone of stress triggered illness, because as well as experiencing everything that her mother in law Naomi is, she also had death of spouse and also changed to a different line of work because she is able to work. And so she has to go out to work in order to survive. And obviously that score is very high. And I think Ruth's mother in law Naomi is aware of that because she actually says to Ruth and her other daughter-in-law, Orpah, she says, you should return to your mother's homes. You should return to both of each of you to your mother's homes. And it's interesting that she says mother's home, not father's home. I think she's trying to make a big thing of the fact that actually Naomi, she's not their mum. They don't have an obligation to her now. They should return to their mother's homes. If they go back to their mother's homes in Moab, then they might be able to find some relief of their stress. Maybe in time marry again. Naomi wants to protect her daughters from a very precarious future with her because she's going back to Bethlehem. This morning's theme is love always protects and we see Naomi attempting to protect Ruth and Orpah from living in Israel as refugees. No, go to the land of Moab, back to the land of Moab, otherwise you might be treated poorly as refugees in Israel. Naomi manages to persuade Orpah but Ruth won't leave her mother-in-law. She says this, don't urge me to leave you or to to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Basically, she is vowing faithfulness till death, as we do actually in marriage vows. It's that kind of strength of promise, of covenant. Despite that dramatic commitment, Naomi, the mother-in-law, she's actually not pleased. In fact, she stops speaking to Ruth on their journey to Bethlehem. So perhaps we should add an extra 29 points to Ruth's score because 
trouble in with the in-laws is 29 on the stress scale. It's maybe an extra 29 points because Naomi is not speaking to Ruth. So they go to Bethlehem where Naomi's from. She's got to go there because that's where relatives will provide for her. So they go back, just Naomi and Ruth. And when Naomi sees her friends and relatives, she says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant or sweet. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Mara means bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. I think we should pause in the story here and think about this just a little. When loads of bad or stress-inducing stuff happens to us all in a row, it's not uncommon for people of faith to blame God or hold God responsible in some way. The Almighty has made my life very bitter. The Lord has brought me back empty. We're thinking about how love always protects this morning. And if God is love, surely God always protects. But then we see in Naomi's life how it feels when God's protection appears to have gone. It feels bitter. Naomi's attitude here resembles that of another figure in the Old Testament, Job. Following great suffering, he says, I loathe my very life. Therefore, I will give free reign to my complaints and speak out in the bitterness of my soul. He complains to God about the bitter state of his soul. When we feel like God is not protecting us and we're upset about that and complaining about that, we do so with Naomi and Job and many of those who wrote the Psalms. Dare I say it, it's biblical to bellow our bitterness of soul before God. But that's not where the story ends. Because Ruth is actually not part of the religious tradition of Israel. She is a Moabite S. It doesn't seem to be her way to bellow her bitterness of soul before God as Naomi does. Even though Ruth has a higher stress score, instead, she's exceptionally practical. She goes to find food in the fields. Someone's got to provide for her mother-in-law. It may as well be her. She says to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Just to give a bit of context here, the law of Israel instructed harvesters to leave some grain behind for the poor or the refugee in the land. It was like an early form of benefits, so that no one would truly be without sustenance. No one. It was a safety net for people who fell on hard times, like Naomi, like Ruth. So Naomi says, yeah, go. She lets Ruth go to pick up leftover grain. And coincidentally, or providentially, she begins working in the field of Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi's deceased husband, Elimelech. And Boaz isn't there at first. Ruth works there all day, picking up grain. And when Boaz arrives, he notices, who is this strange woman in my fields? His servant tells him that it is the Moabite daughter-in-law, of Naomi, who has returned to her homeland. The question is, what will Boaz do next? Let's not forget that Moabites and Israelites don't usually get on, and that Naomi swanned off to Moab when Israel had a famine, and now here she is sending this Moabite daughter-in-law to scrounge off his productive land. What will he say to her? That's our reading. We're going to have that read for us, what Boaz says. Thank you. Right. The reading is from the book of Ruth, chapter 2, verses 8 to 12. So Boaz said to Ruth, 
my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Wow, what a beautiful welcome Boaz gives to Ruth. What kindness, what kindness. In fact, if I had preached the sermon on love is kind, I was thinking of this story, telling this story. But actually, Ruth and Boaz's words and actions can tell us a lot about how love always protects. Here are three things. Firstly, Ruth puts love always protects into action by making and keeping promises. She didn't have to commit to Naomi in the way that she did, but she chose to, and it gave her mother-in-law stability. The philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote that promises are islands of certainty in an ocean of uncertainty. And some promises, like Ruth's and like marriage vows, are for life. Some are just for a season, like the ones we make to one another and to God every year at our covenant service. But either way, by making and keeping promises, we give some stability, some continuity. We show our intention to walk together. That's what Ruth did for Naomi. And imagine if she hadn't. And Naomi had to make that journey from Moab back to Bethlehem as a solitary widow. Imagine what could have happened to her. Boaz marvels at the faithfulness Ruth showed Naomi. Naomi may have come home bellowing her bitterness before God. But without Ruth, she would never have got home. Ruth made promises and protected her when Naomi felt like God had withdrawn his protection. How interesting is that? Could it be that Ruth was God's instrument for protecting Naomi? Might we open up our eyes to the faithfulness of those around us and how they mediate the providence and protection of God? Might we offer ourselves to be like Ruth, whose promises created an island of certainty in an ocean of uncertainty? I realise that the idea of making and keeping promises can seem daunting, uh, and thus we tend not to make them in case we break them. However, they don't always have to be huge. Perhaps we know someone who has a pretty high stress score this year. Maybe we promise to send a weekly message just for a month, just a weekly message to check in. Or maybe we promise to go to the next hospital visit with next hospital appointment with them. Or, or maybe we promise to help a friend or a relative with all the admin that needs to be done after they've lost a loved one. Maybe we promise to pray and we keep that promise. So one way of putting into action this love always protects is by making and keeping promises. Secondly, another way of putting into action love always protects is by making things safer. Making things safer. Boaz mirrors Ruth's protecting of Naomi by offering to protect Ruth. He says, don't glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stick with the women who are gleaning. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, 
you can help yourself to a drink. Boaz seems to be worried that men in other fields may abuse Ruth. He's keen to make sure that Ruth is treated kindly by his workers and he will make sure her basic needs are met. He doesn't want her waiting till break time before she gets a drink. Whenever she's thirsty, she must drink. Whenever you're thirsty. He's making things safer for her. Safe from physical abuse, sexual abuse, xenophobic or racist abuse, misogynistic abuse. Safe from hunger and thirst. He's protecting her by making things safer for her. You might do this. Perhaps in your workplace, making your workplace safer and kinder, especially if you're a boss, but you can do it in other ways if you're not a boss. Or maybe challenging misogynistic or racist words and actions in your work or your club or your friendship group. You might sign petitions and campaign for our country to be more welcoming of refugees. Or you might be looking to protect the environment in some way or campaigning for that. That's all about love always protects too. There are so many ways. You might remember back in 2018, uh, Mike and I wrote a statement for us to, to display as a church that basically said that we as ministers are affirming of LGBT plus people. And we did that when we as a church had not yet agreed a position. We did later, three years later, when we registered our building for same-sex marriage. But we, some people would say we jumped the gun a little bit, that we as the ministers were saying, no, we are affirming. The reason we did that, the reason we did that, is that we wanted to show very clearly that we would welcome and have the back of any LGBT plus people who came here. We wouldn't allow conversion therapy. We wouldn't allow anyone to make them feel unsafe or anyone to ask them to change before they came to faith or were baptised. And of course, some might say we were jumping the gun, but we were leading. And by doing that, we believe we were doing the right thing and we were seeking to make this church safer. Make it safer. Love always protects by making things safer. Thirdly and finally, love always protects is something we participate in, not something we passively receive. Love always protects is something we participate in, it's not something we passively receive. We both give and receive protection. We are not called to receive God's protection passively, but rather partner with God in the work of protecting others and in turn to receive. Boaz says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. As Ruth has allowed herself to be an instrument of God's protection for Naomi, she now finds herself finding God's protection through Boaz. Boaz has this big picture view of the whole thing. Each person a panel in God's patchwork of protection. This is something people participate in. One receives protection as one gives it. God's protection may seem absent to someone who has experienced many bad things in a row and a very high stress score, for example. But that's not the end of the story. Ruth had an exceptionally high score, but as she worked to protect her mother-in-law in the ways that she could, she ended up being humbled and in awe of God's protection of her through Boaz. She found she was part of something much, much bigger. Even she, a foreigner from the land of Moab, had found refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. It's a beautiful image, those divine wings of protection. It's mirrored in Psalm 91, we we read that at the beginning. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. And you might also think of Jesus' words. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. 
In that powerful image, Jesus links the people's failure to protect the prophets with their failure to enter into his loving protection. Will you find protection under Jesus' wings? He describes himself like a mother hen. We might think of those wings like his nail-pierced hands, his arms stretched out on the cross. Will you gather under the cross? Will you let him shoulder and shelter you from trouble, from sin and death? That's what the cross is about. Let Jesus shelter you. Will you come into that loving protection of God? But Jesus links the people's failure to protect the prophets with their failure to enter into his loving protection. But Ruth shows us the other side of this. A willingness to protect and a willingness to receive God's protection go hand in hand. Love always protects is something we participate in. But what if Ruth had not promised anything to Naomi? And what if Boaz had chucked Ruth out of his field? And what if you and I did not protect by making and keeping promises and making things safer and participating in God's patchwork of protection? If that were the case, the world might appear at times almost void of God's protection. But if even Ruth, with a stress score of 349, could be an instrument of God's protection for Naomi, and then humbled and in awe of God's protection through Boaz, perhaps there's hope still for us. We can protect in all different ways, small ways, big ways, and we can receive protection. Because God has never left us. And God always cares. God always wants to gather us under his wings like a mother hen. God is always persuading people to play their part in his patchwork of protection. But perhaps we're numb, or perhaps we're too callous to take God up on that invitation, to play our part in that patchwork of protection. But that is the invitation. He's always inviting us to be a part of that because God is always protecting. But he's asking us to be a part of that. It's mediated through us more often than not. So will you play your part? Will you play your part? Will you play your part in God's patchwork of protection? Let me finish with Boaz's words to Ruth. Hear them for you afresh today. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Amen.